Now we continue with the digestive system. And what we're concerned with here is the fate of the cheeseburger that we discussed at the, um, in the last lecture. And so we left off with the cheeseburger having been broken down. Um, all the mechanical digestion of that meal is completed by the time this food emerges from the stomach. And what's left is further chemical digestion and then uh, the absorption of those nutrients into the bloodstream. And then finally, uh, the removal of the remainder, which is the waste products that are pooped out or defecated. Um, so that's the scope of the, of the current lecture. And the question that we're pursuing here is how are these nutrients um, absorbed? A secondary question is um, how they are further broken down through the digestive enzymes in the small intestine. Now, from the, the food that you eat, what do you get? Well, of course, food is a source of energy. And um, energy comes in its most dense, dense form in, um, in uh, fat, which is more than twice the energy, um, energy density as what's available in the carbohydrates and proteins. Building products. There are nine essential amino acids that your body cannot synthesize, so that must come from food. Fatty acids are essential for membrane structure. Again, it must come from your food. And then finally, we have many, many vitamins and minerals that can only come from your food. So you need a balanced diet in order to um, get these important uh, building materials and uh, the vitamins and minerals that provide major functions for your physiology. So let's consider the rest of the digestive anatomy uh, and the parts that are gonna be featured in this lecture. So the liver plays a role. You're gonna see the liver for uh, the remainder of, of these lectures play sort of a recurring role. In this lecture, we'll see how it's really important for um, the the um, breakdown and absorption of fat. The small uh, intestines are the most important organ for nutrient uh, absorption. The large intestine plays um, a smaller but yet important role because it houses uh, a microbiome that breaks down, well, as a byproduct of the metabolism of that microbiome, there are essential vitamins that are uh, produced which are then absorbed in addition to water uh, before your waste is packaged in the form of uh, feces. The pancreas plays an important role. Um, it secretes uh, bicarbonate and digestive enzymes, as we'll see. And then finally, the waste products are packaged in a rectum. And in each of the major portions of the GI tract, they can be separated uh, from one another by these muscular valves called sphincters, uh, which close off one region from the next. The first portion of the small intestine is called the duodenum, and that is the site for the secretions of bile salts for fat digestion and digestive enzymes. We're gonna talk most about that. And then the absorption that begins at the duodenum then progresses um, as the meal moves through the rest of the small intestines. And just because there are diminishing returns on that, basically there's a lot of nutrients of the meal as it emerges from the stomach and then less and less as it moves further, then you can imagine that there's gonna be less nutrient absorption uh, as the meal progresses. But all of what I'll detail applies, you know, to the entire length of the small intestine. So back to the cheeseburger. Um, the cheeseburger, when we left off, was uh, getting worked on in the stomach that's the final opportunity for mechanical digestion. Then, um, then we, we're gonna have absorption here. Now a key feature of the, the small intestine is the composition of its membrane, um, which is called the gastric mucosa. So that includes the epithelium, connective tissue, and the smooth muscles that surround it. Here we see the epithelial um, membrane. It features um, finger-like projections, the villi, and these crypts, which are invaginations. It's very well vascularized, so you can imagine lots of capillaries. And then there are also these vessels from the lymphatic system called lacteals, 
they play a role in fat um, absorption. And if we zoom in on this membrane, in particular, one of the villi, then we can consider a couple of the cell types that we're gonna talk about. First of all, there are just the absorptive cells, which do play a role in chemical digestion and also the transport of nutrients into the bloodstream. They feature um, their own finger-like projections, which are called microvilli. And the apical surface is um, referred, off, uh, referred to often as the brush border. And it's there that you'll find some digestive enzymes that are anchored to that apical membrane and therefore aren't swept uh, through the, the small intestine like some of the other enzymes. There are also um, endocrine cells that function as sensory cells and integration centers for the release of digestive hormones. And we'll feature a couple of those um, which aid in the digestion of the meal. Now, the first challenge for this region of the small intestine is to neutralize the acidic and toxic through, uh, through the, the pepsin that's in the, the center of uh, the stomach to neutralize those substances so that they don't burn a hole in the gastric mucosa. Now, the food as it emerges um, is in this uh, semi-liquid state. And, um, and that's called, the, the term that's used for that is chyme, which is a rather sort of vulgar, vulgar word. Um, and chyme you can think of as an acidic food slurry. Sounds yummy, huh? Um, now, the chyme, because it just emerged from the stomach, has hydrochloric acid, giving it a low pH. That is recognized by those endocrine cells. Um, and in response, they release a hormone called secretin. So secretin is released in the bloodstream. It's also released in the gut lumen, where it can be detected by other digestive cells. Secretin has um, a number of responses. First of all, it inhibits acid secretion within the stomach. Your stomach produces hydrochloric acid, releases it into the gut lumen, but only at high concentrations when it's needed. Okay, it's toxic, it takes energy to produce, so secretin reduces those secretions. In order to neutralize the low pH, or the, the acidic chyme, then we have the pancreas playing a role. And secretin um, has an effect on the pancreas. In particular, it releases bicarbonate. So the pancreas, in this context, you can think of as a gland that secretes bicarbonate and also digestive enzymes, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, the bicarbonate then acts on the chyme to neutralize the hydrochloric acid. So here we have those protons, that's our hydrogen, uh, chloride uh, ions, and then the bicarbonate that's released, and you can just assume that sodium will be available. The um, chemical reaction here is the production of um, carbonic acid and uh, sodium chloride, which will rise the, um, the pH of the chyme considerably. And then once the pH has uh, risen, then pepsin, which was toxic uh, to proteins, it will break down proteins, uh, becomes neutralized at that high pH. So the release of secretin largely deals with this problem of a toxic meal that emerges from the stomach. Now the release of the chyme also triggers, this is through those um, endocrine cells, um, another hormone called col cholecystokinin, or CCK. So CCK uh, is released, again, in the bloodstream and in the gut lumen. And there it acts on the smooth muscles that line the small intestine. Now, I mentioned that when we were talking about smooth muscle, that they have a capacity to autonomously generate action potentials and to essentially activate themselves to generate contractions. Uh, such as peristaltic waves and uh, churning in the GI tract. CCK uh, 
acts on ligand gated channels that therefore influence the contractions by the smooth muscles. And it does so to reduce the activity of those muscles. So essentially, if you're eating a really fatty meal, this is a way of adjusting how the small intestine manages that meal. Fats take longer to digest and therefore reducing gut motility is a strategy for enhancing the absorption of fat. So CCK um, release does that. It also has a couple of other uh, responses um, that are related to the absorption of fat. For example, the liver produces something called bile salts, or you can just think of it as bile. Uh, sorry, we got a lot going on here. So, um, so bile salts help, I'll explain in a moment how, how does it, but they help in the uh, ability to absorb fats. And therefore, it's advantageous to release bile uh, for fatty meals. And, um, and bile is contained within something called the gall bladder. Okay, think of it as being like a urinary bladder in that it has a smooth muscle lining and CCK stimulates contraction of those smooth muscles. So that squirts bile that then moves along this duct uh, and it is released into the gut lumen. Okay, that's where we have uh, the bile that comes from the gallbladder excreted through this little opening here, which is called the common bile duct. It's an opening that provides a route, not just for the bile salts to enter into the GI tract, but also those digestive enzymes that come from the pancreas. CCK also stimulates the pancreas to release enzymes, ions, and water. And those include a variety of enzymes, including trypsin, colipase, amylase, etc., that are secreted by the pancreas. Okay, so then what happens is your meal has now, it's the chyme that has been neutralized, all the mechanical digestion has been achieved, and there's just the matter of taking large molecules and making them smaller so that they can be absorbed as the meal progresses through the rest of the small intestine. So the duodenum essentially solves the toxic chyme problem, adds some enzymes, and then passes off the meal to the rest of the GI tract. So everything I'm gonna describe follows those actions and allows for nutrient absorption. So we're gonna consider carbohydrates, proteins, and then fats. So for carbs, carbohydrates are polymers of um, simple sugars, uh, such as glucose. Those could be starches, glycogen, for example. And um, I've already mentioned amylase. You have amylase secreted in your mouth. You're, um, you begin, even as you're chewing a meal, you begin the breakdown of carbohydrates. And if you chew on something like a saltine cracker, uh, long enough and you have a very acute sense of taste, then you might be able to pick up on the fact that, that it gets sweeter in your mouth because there's a, there's a very simple breakdown by amylase of a glucose polymer into uh, dye and monosaccharides. So there are um, the disaccharides produced by amylase and they also, uh, amylase is also secreted by the pancreas. Uh, then there's the final matter of breaking up the, um, the disaccharides into monosaccharides, and that is achieved at the brush border. So there are brush border enzymes so that when disaccharides come in contact with the apical surface of these, um, these uh, absorptive cells, then we have this conversion into monosaccharides, including glucose. There's also fructose. Uh, galactose um, that are also shown schematically here. You don't have to memorize uh, any more of these. Um, just worry about the words that are written on the slides. I'll mention some others along the way, names of enzymes and, and so forth uh, that you don't need to uh, worry about uh, memorizing. And we've already talked about glucose absorption. The other monosaccharides are 
um, also uh, transported across the apical membrane of the absorptive cells through secondary active transport, um, taking advantage of the sodium gradient. So I'm not going to uh, detail how that occurs because that was a topic of an earlier lecture. Uh, and therefore we can move on to proteins. Well, what are proteins? Proteins have um, an amino terminal, uh, and then they are composed of a, a string of amino acids that are bound together through peptide bonds. And then that's um, terminated with uh, the carboxy terminal. Now, there is a class of enzymes that act on the interior peptide bonds in these molecules. Those are called endopeptidases, like pepsin is one of them. And uh, the product of the action of those enzymes is to, is to produce smaller proteins, in particular uh, small peptides and tripeptides. Then the outermost peptide bonds can be acted upon by what are called exopeptidases. And that produces amino acids and dipeptides. Okay, so now we've got some pretty small molecules that can be transported. Let's consider how that transport works. Um, protein absorption is actually very similar to uh, glucose absorption. Again, there's uh, taking advantage of the sodium gradient and using that via secondary after transport to move those small molecules against a concentration gradient potentially on the apical surface of the membrane. So that occurs for amino acids. It's then a matter of facilitated diffusion across the basal membrane. Um, and then once they have moved across that membrane, then they can be um, transported into the circulatory system. Um, so that's how amino acids are transported. It's also how tri and dipeptides are transported. However, instead of using sodium for secondary active transport, um, instead, uh, protons or hydrogen, hydrogen ions are um, the source of secondary active transport, that is for tri and di peptides, like that. Now, small peptides can be transported, but they're too large for just mere secondary active transport. And so instead, they're essentially packaged into vesicles so that they don't actually enter into the cytoplasm of the absorptive cells, but instead move across the cell through a process known as transcytosis. So you can think of this small peptide as essentially uh, moving through in a force field almost, a portion of the cellular membrane is pinched off to form a vesicle, and then it is transported across the interior of the cell without actually mixing with the chemicals on its interior. So that brings us to fat absorption. So imagine that the fats that emerge from the stomach are mixed up in the chyme slurry, and uh, in that mixture are uh, fat droplets. Now, um, if you imagine a um, salad dressing as being olive oil and vinegar, and if you shake it up, then the olive oil will uh, momentarily break up into these kinds of droplets. Now, if uh, given time, the fat droplets will find one another and form large fat droplets, which is difficult because it doesn't allow for the action of enzymes on most of that volume, and um, it's too large for absorption. So here's where the bile salts come in. Bile salts stabilize fat droplets and prevent them from merging. So as your stomach churns away, and bile salts are available, then the bile salts will coat, coat, coat the surface of the fat droplets and prevent them from reforming. Uh, these little fat droplets are called micelles, and the micelles um, include triglycerides and cholesterols. Now the micelles are small enough that when enzymes act upon them, that the fats are isolated enough for them to be absorbed. And the enzymes uh, from triglycerides and uh, cholesterols, or, or I should say from the triglycerides, will produce monoglycerides and free fatty acids. 
So now we're at the scale where absorption can easily occur, especially because these are fats and therefore are lipid soluble. So these will um, diffuse across the cell membrane and into the cytoplasm of those absorptive cells. Cholesterol uh, requires transport and there are transporters for cholesterol. Uh, and so the cholesterol can also enter into the interior of the cell. Now, once inside of the cell, the fat is handled differently from carbohydrates and proteins. They uh, fuse with the Golgi apparatus, and then from that point, they're transported across the cell and released uh, into the interstitial space, and in particular, uh, make their way into those vessels called lacteals for the, um, uh, the lymphatic system. So that's how fats are absorbed. Uh, we've talked about carbohydrates and we've talked about proteins. All that remains for the meal is what occurs in the large intestine. Now it's called large because it's a large diameter. It's actually much shorter in length. We see it uh, highlighted in green here. It's not actually green. Um, and it um, has uh, some sphincters, the first of which separates the small from the large intestine. Um, it, there are a variety of functions. We have a lot of water absorption occurring in the small in the large intestine. This is good, so we don't um, we don't produce diarrhea whenever we have to defecate. Uh, it also houses bacteria. I mentioned the microbiome in the uh, large intestine, and how the metabolic products of that microbiome uh, provide nutrients, essential vitamins, and minerals. Uh, and then there's also the matter of storing and condensing the feces uh, for getting rid of them when you want to. Now, one little thing about uh, defecation that I'll mention is that uh, your anus uh, features um, sphincters that are um, composed of smooth muscle on the interior and skeletal muscle on the exterior. And we saw that there was a skeletal muscle sphincter for the urinary bladder. And uh, why do you think that is, that your body has both types? Well, uh, recall that skeletal muscle is under the somatic efferent pathway. And that allows for voluntary conscious control of those skeletal muscles. So whenever you see a sphincter that's composed of skeletal muscles, just think, okay, that's the opportunity to consciously control something. Now, what happens when you have to defecate, when you get that sensation is the within your rectum the feces open up the sphincter that's that's comprised of smooth muscle that's the interior sphincter and that's when you feel like you've really got to go but fortunately the external sphincter has skeletal muscle so you uh, can control when you actually defecate uh, and then that's finally when you actually poop out the feces and get rid of the waste Okay, so how are nutrients absorbed? We've talked about a lot. There are a lot of details about the digestive system. In the duodenum, we have, first of all, the low pH and presence of pepsin that are handled by the, re the release of secretin. Okay, so it's a matter of the pancreas uh, neutralizing that, um, that low pH environment through the release of bicarbonate. CCK is also released by the fat in the meal, which reduces gut motility and stimulates the release of bile salts. We also have digestive enzymes secreted by the pancreas as well. That leaves absorption in the small intestines, uh, where we considered the fate of monosaccharides, small peptides, um, cholesterols, monoglycerides, and free fatty acids. Um, this is small peptides and even smaller uh, proteins. Then that leaves the large intestines where we had water absorption, the presence of a microbiome, and this action of defecation, the release of waste products.